Welcome to the Spiritual Danger Close Podcast. I'm your host, Latter-day Retainer. Before we begin, I want to forewarn you. If you hear any strange noises, jingling, small bells, those are my two very rambunctious cats. This podcast will primarily be the readings of my blogs from the Spiritual Danger Close blog. I realize that not everyone has time to sit down and read what is essentially a two to four page paper. Many individuals have full schedules from work to school to errands to managing a home life. A podcast allows you to listen while you're going throughout your day. Personally, I have around 10 podcasts that I frequently listen to. Most of the time I'm in my car or on my motorcycle. Often when I'm tidying up my apartment, I have a podcast playing to make the time go by faster. I felt impressed to do a podcast after another individual recommended Anchor. I found the startup was super streamlined and very friendly. It took me about 10 minutes to mess around with all the settings. If you're looking for your new podcast to host, Anchor might be for you. For right now, there is no monetization on the channel. In the future, I'd like to provide advertisement from companies within the community. If you'd be interested in creating an advertisement, please reach out to me on Twitter. The expressed viewpoints are mine and not necessarily that of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. For every episode, there will be references, so please check out the blog for the full citation. This episode is titled The Expanse, and personally has been my favorite uh, blog that I've written so far. I really got into the thick of it. Uh, I did not indicate so on the original posting, but I've actually been thinking about this uh, very topic that I'm about to discuss on this episode since the very beginning. It was one of those topic blog ideas that I was uh, inferring, brewing in the background. By brewing, I was researching and thinking about it, and it was really hard not to go on these offshoots and tangents, and eventually I found myself written into a corner, per se, that I started going down this rabbit hole, and I realized that a lot of people may be lost in it, so I was really trying to make sure that one, I was writing to what the actual idea is and the philosophy, and two, that I could write it in such a way that anybody could read it and understand what's going on. So I really hope that that is what I encaptured. Uh, if it's not, I do apologize. But getting into this episode, this is a very long read at almost 4,000 words, including the references, something that has been on my mind as late from a television show, as I was unaware of the book series by the same name. I would like to say, aside from some pornographic scenes, which are totally unnecessary in storytelling, The Expanse is one of my favorite science fiction series. James S.A. Corey is the pen name used by the authors Daniel Abram and Ty Frump for their book series which has since been adapted by it as a television show. Both medias have won critical acclaim in their portrayal of a space opera. If you were a fan of Battlestar Galactica, the show might be something you would enjoy. I'm not sure if there's some family edited version, as some episodes could be considered R-rated. From the futuristic space narrative, it has almost a western frontier story to feel to it. Add in some very detailed spacecraft designs, fleshed out backstories and suspenseful spaceship fights, and use of some scientific principles, the latter has received praise for scientific realism when the real world science is used, but of course there is fiction and a story telling elements. Spoilers ahead for The Expanse. I was a little shocked to see in the story, which takes place several hundred years in the future, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. These future saints were following the revelation of their time and are building a space ark to go to where God dwells. Christ had not come in his promised second coming, and the faithful had had to come to him. A space ark is also known as a generational ship, which is a conceptual theory of building a massive spaceship which could hold enough people and supplies and make it to another planet for colonization. Well, here we have 23rd century members of the faith striving to be obedient to God's commands. Detractors of the faith would use this as an argument to the delusion of religion. I have been thinking on this lately, and I've been thinking if this did happen, does this make our faith irrelevant, or does God change his mind, 
How about, is this something that could happen, but what of all those previous prophecies? When science peered beyond Earth's atmosphere, it did not find proof of God. Smith placed God's throne somewhere distant, but a real place that given the right technologies, humans could travel to. Now, as much as I would like to go in the direction, I would be distracted from my real purpose in this post. I am not concerned about us maybe one day having to leave this earth. Personally, in a secular mind, I know we must leave this earth for a species to continue. Think of it along the lines of not all your eggs in one basket. I also don't see how there's any issue with the story of the expanse. Tells with the respect to future saints, building a generational ship. Given the theology in which I feel and what I say know to be true from the things I've experienced, that this is not a far-fetched idea to discount something like this beyond the realm of possibility. Our God is the God of the impossible. Deep diving into the research, I wish to frame my research boundaries. 1. Does a deviation from revelation to actual events make a prophet a false prophet? Further, does that mean that God is not omniscient? To address this, we'll need to look at instances in which revelation was given and what followed could be considered contrary. Definition of prophecy. While this may be some obvious to some, not to others, understanding what a prophecy is, or rather the paradigm in which we interpret the meaning of prophecy is an important consideration. Merriam-Webster defines prophecy as one, the inspired utterance of a prophet, two, the function or vocation of a prophet, specifically the inspired declaration of the divine will and purpose, three, a prediction of something to come, Davidson, 2005, notes that, quote, philosopher rarely argue about who actually prophesied what. In some tradition, prophecy isn't always a foretelling of the future and often deals with revealing the will of the divine. Prophecy is something that all three Abrahamic religions agree on. The difference is whose prophecy is correct. In Islam, there are five pillars of faith, and one of those pillars is prophecy. Further, Muslims believe that Muhammad is the greatest and last of all prophets, that the prophet is bearing a message of God, given a book, signs, and miracles, and testimony of their divine appointing of deity. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints defines prophecies as, quote, divinely inspired words or writings which a person receives through revelation from the Holy Ghost, end quote. Revelation 19.10 says, quote, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, end quote, that this prophecy may come to us all by the power of the Holy Ghost. While Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all argue to whose prophecy is correct, they all three equally agree that prophecy foretells the future or of God's will at the time it's revealed. In trying to make sense of this philosophy and theology, Abrahamic religions crossed over to each other's theological lines on their way to a resolution to an answer. Contingency. For philosophers, they need to define one of two things. Is the will of God's message necessary or contingent? Simply, does it need to happen? Necessary. Might it happen? Contingent. Or will it never happen? The impossible. See philosophy terms on page one describing the difference between contingent and necessary. Davidson, 2005, uses the story of Jesus' prophecy of Peter betraying him three times, as Peter's actual act of denial is contingent in nature, agency and his choice or free will. It's this all-knowing nature of God that make, in some cases, like Christ's prophecy of Peter's denial, a problem in philosophy. If Jesus, with God-like knowledge, knew that Peter would deny him, what of any free will does that leave Peter with? It's this divine foreknowledge that makes the examination of certain prophecies a puzzle to the philosopher. If this sounds very familiar to you, then you have heard of predestination, which came from this philosophical debate of God's knowledge. Predestination argues that Peter... Once Jesus prophesied of the denial occurring three times meant that Peter without any will of self was only able to do 
anything but deny Christ three times. One such answer to this is known as open theism, which Davison, 2005, explains, quote, There may be future contingent events, but God does not know about them, and that to some, open theists argue that foreknowledge, quote, would be providentially useless to God, end quote. Skipping through a philosophical lecture on contingency and foreknowledge, you arrive at the open theist problem. Does God limit future knowledge and only wield such when probability of an individual's action leads to no other option? Think of it like a teacher telling their student, if you don't study for the test, you will fail. Until you take the test, your probability of passing or failing is equal. But if you start to not take the time to study in class, it becomes clearer to the teacher that you will fail the test, in which you do since you did not study. You do fail that test that day. William Ockham was a medieval Christian philosopher who found a way to philosophically account for the foreknowledge of God and contingency. Ockham argued that what a prophet may have said could or may now be false. Quote, Occam's idea is that were Peter to f choose freely not to deny Jesus instead, then Jesus would never have prophesied that Peter would deny him, end quote. This idea agrees with foreordination and says that if there really was any other option, then why did Jesus prophesy specifically? Occam leads to interesting logical puzzles which to some philosophers, such as Finch and Ray in 2008, argue that it's incompatible with other belief systems or rather perspectives. Atemporalism. Some biblical passages have led to interesting philosophical ideas, one of which is that God exists outside of time. Doing so would allow foreknowledge to coexist with contingency allowing agency while not necessarily accepting forced destinies as predestination asserts, looking at perspectives of such biblical passages as Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 9 gave evidence to suggest that this might be the case. An unceasing eternity would allow God the ability to know everything. This idea can be seen in the works of Christian theologians as early as 500 CE as thought of by Bothius. Quote, since God has condition of ever-present eternity, his knowledge, which passes over every change of time, embracing infinite lengths of past and future, views and its own direct comprehension, everything as though it were taking place in the present. End quote. In Canon of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there are some scriptures that also suggest that God might exist atemporally. Quote, the course of the Lord is one eternal round, end quote. This phrasing is unique to the scriptures and evokes some powerful mental images. The similar phrasing was also revealed to Joseph Smith as recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, which said, quote, For God doth not walk in crooked paths, neither doth he turn from right hand nor to the left, neither doth he vary from that which he hath said. Therefore, his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. End quote. Al Qadir. Islam agrees with some Christian theologies of predestination, that is, Allah knows everything, then nothing happens unless Allah willed it to be so. Al Qadir is, quote, Allah already knows everything that will ever happen in the universe. End quote. In the Quran, one verse has led to Islamic scholarship accepting predestination. Quote, the Lord has created and balanced all things and has fixed their destinies and guided them, end quote. However, in Islam, individuals have free will to make morally correct choices, but correct course is caveating that Allah knew they would neither fail or succeed in discipleship. Quote, and you cannot will unless it be that Allah wills, end quote. The idea is seen through the Quran is the theology of nothing happens unless Allah allows it. Quote, verily, the verses of the Quran is an ammunition, so whosoever wills, let him take the path to his Lord, Allah. You cannot will unless Allah wills. Verily, Allah is ever all-knowing, all-wise. He will admit to his mercy whom he wills as 
for the Zalimun, polytheist wrongdoers, he has prepared a painful torment. End quote. Incomprehensible. In the inspired revelation of the Book of Moses, we see the expanded telling of the Moses' experience. He is caught up to a high mountain, received a portion of the glory of God to be in the presence of God. When God, Heavenly Father, introduces himself, he says, Behold, quote, Behold, I am the Lord God Almighty, endless is my name, for I am without beginning of days or end of years, and is not this endless, end quote. How can the human mind comprehend endless? To, rem to remain in the boundaries I set previously, I will stay away from the Trinitarian view of God. Simply, it is not biblical in nature and was set through various creeds. It attempted to combine Greek philosophy with sac scriptural text, the doctrine position of the Church of Jesus Christ, is that the Godhead is quote we declare it is self-evident from the scriptures that the Father the Son and Holy Ghost are separate persons three divine beings end quote while this theology may seem incorrect to others it is historically and scripturally accurate and doesn't require a creed to justify its reasoning knowing that God the Father and Jesus have bodies does make the essence of deity more comprehensible the scriptural quotes of God's love to us become even more real and tangible to our minds. However, let us remember that God introduced himself to Moses and he said his name was endless. Quote, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and I shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. End quote. Tesseract. While pondering these ideas, I thought of the Tesseract. If you do not know what that is, or are unfamiliar with the fourth dimension theory, go and watch the video. Carl Sagan explains this eloquently with the theory of the fourth dimension. We are three-dimensional beings trying to comprehend a deity that is endless. Previously, I discussed contingency in relation to prophecy. Is prophecy something that might happen or must happen? Can Jesus tell Peter he will deny him three times and not negate the will of Peter? Or in doing so, does that mean that we're all predestined to God's will as in the Islamic doctrine of Al-Qadr? God exists endlessly as his ways are one eternal round. If you believe you have a choice in choosing right or wrong, can a prophecy also exist in the same pro manner? Can you think of a prophecy that has been unfulfilled or a prophecy that can never be fulfilled? Unfulfilled prophecy. Digging up accounts of unfulfilled prophecy is a difficult task. I was almost decided to continue, not to continue this post. In my research, I came across several instances that apologists over at Fair Mormon cover. Digressing from the blog, I would like to add that the reason why you don't see any unfulfilled prophecies is as they were compiling the Holy Scriptures of the, the, the Bible, there were intentional scriptures that were left out because individuals felt that they were not real or they were false, whatever the narrative choice was that they chose. Just caveat as to why it's hard to find that. Finding some instances of this in LDS canon is possible. As I continue. These are often used as evidence of Joseph Smith being a fraud. Fair Mormon examines 16 claims of prophecy by Joseph Smith. Half of these false prophecy claims that are hard to attribute to Joseph Smith having set, even said them. Example, Doctrine and Covenants section 114 is used as a claim of false prophecy for the David Patton did not serve a mission and was dead, quote, six months later, end quote. Evidence sides with section 114 being a mission call and not a prophecy as some claim. For the case of the prophecy was in the revelation David Patton should prepare to serve a mission. 
Other instances of prophecy are declared false, all dealing with the situation in which the prophecy is predicted on individuals, groups, or their faithfulness. Sometimes hostile individuals prevent prophecy from being fulfilled. Fair Mormon points to Doctrine and Covenants section 57 about building the Temple of Independence, Missouri, but as history shows, this is unfulfilled and the hostile parties drove the saints from the area in 1833. Another example would be the Law of Consecration. The law, the revelation that church members would join all their property and the bishop would give out from supply equally as all they had needed. Yet again, history shows the law of consecration was a failed prophecy in one sense of the word. It was the members' unfaithfulness that prevented the fulfillment of the revelation. Section 84 is several verses which critics of the church argue to be false prophecies, from the Temple of Independence to the destruction in New York and Boston. When it comes to Joseph Smith's revelations, visions, or opinion, detractors are quick to declare Joseph as a fraud prophet. Yet, it is obvious that at times Joseph was chastened and corrected, such in trying to discern the time of second coming. Ultimately, Joseph revealed he was asked to not inquire any more about the time of Christ's second coming. If you look at anti-Mormon Christian writers, they like to point out how often Joseph Smith's revelation mentioned that soon the coming of Christ. Quote, Old Joe, you claimed it to be, but it's been 175 years. That doesn't seem soon. End quote. Yet, they turn around on Sunday and preach their congregation that Christ will soon be ready to come. Second coming. Scriptures repeatedly tell us signs of the second coming. They are yet to happen, with many left unfulfilled. This is true for Christian and Islamic traditions. Some Jewish, Jewish scholars argue that Jesus of Nazareth was not the messianic figure of their Bible. From the events that followed the crucifixion of Jesus to present day, are enough for these Jewish scholars to denounce Jesus as being a foretold Messiah. Quote, First of all, we find this to be a contrived answer since there is no mention of a second coming in the Jewish Bible. Second, why couldn't God accomplish his goals the first time around? Most importantly, the second coming idea is an attempt to answer an obvious question, but certainly does not constitute proof of messianic claims. End quote. If we continue this line of logic, which is used against Joseph Smith's prophethood, we can extend this to all prophecies of the second coming. Quote, old, insert prophet's name, claimed, it's been 1,988 years. That doesn't seem soon. End quote. Avi Loeb is an Israeli astrophysicist that hinted at a recent discovery, possibly being extraterrestrial nature. While being interviewed by several podcasters and journalists, he made a striking point which I'll summarize. He said, for the proof of which religion, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, is correct, relies on Christ's return. All three must wait until Christ comes again. Until that happens, neither three will be completely certain who is correct, and all three must hear it from Christ. Summary. In the beginning, I asked some questions, and I attempted to find evidence that I might answer them. I asked if one day we may be told in Revelation that we are to leave this planet and go to where God dwells. If this does occur, does that make our, re our previous revelations irrelevant? Does God change his mind? From there, I framed what prophecy is, and it's contingent on cultural or theological paradigm. Prophecy informs us of God's will, such as commandment or a warning of things to come at a future time. When examining prophecies, philosophers ask, does it need to happen, will it happen, or must it happen? By doing this, it helps determine the essence of prophecy. If God is all-knowing, then does a specific prophecy invalidate one's choice, or are we all governed by predestination? As some arguments are for predestination, there are arguments against predestination. That God can know for a certain event how it will occur, but equally allows us to choose some argue that God ignores knowing all events or that God can examine events independent from time. In trying to frame whether something God said can happen or if something declared might not ever happen, we must remember our ways are not his ways. If a prophecy is unfulfilled, does not make it null and void. The saints were promised many things in the early history of the church. 
but due to events, those remain unfulfilled. It doesn't mean that they won't happen, nor does it mean that the person who revealed such isn't a prophet. Rather, we see a loving God that allows us still the opportunity to choose between right and wrong. In researching this question and writing this out, my faith has been bolstered. I don't deny that God can't yet change the script on us. I'm not saying that the second coming will not happen or that the promised blessings will not occur. I think I'm simply stating that our God is a God of wonders. Endless is his name. His ways are incomprehensible to my natural mind. I feel that the church's used Christ of Latter-day Saints is his ordained church. Because I feel and know the Book of Mormon to be true, this leads me to trust in our current president of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, Russell M. Nelson, being a prophet holding all the keys of priesthood. If at the next general conference, President Nelson reveals we are all to build a space ark, I would recall the promise of the Lord to know by the power of the Holy Ghost the truth of all things. The next thing I would do is eagerly look forward to the Church's space program. If you made it to the end of this episode, The Expanse, I want to give you a big, warm hug. Thank you. I appreciate your time. It really does mean a lot to me. The The point of the Spiritual Danger Close is, is to help people with wherever they are and with whatever they're doing and maybe give you a different paradigm or a way to examine things that you haven't thought of before. I'm not really trying to do apologetics, but by the definition of it, I am doing apologetics. I'm not trying to do what others have done before. I'm merely writing on things that I feel I should write on. While I technically did record the audio in February this year, I somehow managed to go several months without uploading it. I wanted to make sure that I had recorded exactly what I wrote and there wasn't something weird where I got to the end and I'm almost finishing and then the cat jumps on me or I get a phone call or I get mad and I just stop recording. So I listened to it again. And I found it interesting that I could feel the spirit kind of tell me, hey, you should look at this or, or re-examine this or, or go here. And I've never had that happen before. I don't really count my own spiritual journals as, as something that, um, or let me rephrase it. I use my spiritual journals to write down thoughts and ideas so I can re-attack them later and kind of trigger a domino of exploring things spiritually or secularly, whatever I wrote, write down in there, uh, in my studies, in my, in, in my discipleship. But I've not really had that from something that I've, I've written before to where I listened to it and I felt I could do something better or to expand my understanding and reality of my relation to deity and my my experience and so i found that very very interesting so i really do hope that you get something out of this and if you do please let me know on twitter or you can go to the blog and leave a comment if you would like to see the references that i used they're going to be on the blogs i feel like using the blog and then posting to the recording to anchor is this going to be a solid solid format that i'll stick with uh, some of the episodes I can't really post over. They don't really work well. Uh, maybe I'll reach out to Leland Tanner for that, that episode and actually do a, a real Q&A. But this is what I have so far. If you've got through this point, I appreciate it. I give you thanks. I hope you have a good day and that maybe I said something that helps you. And if I did, I feel like that's the point of this blog. And that's that's my satisfaction from this at the end of the day. I thank you. If you haven't been told yet today, you are loved. God loves you. You're a great individual. You may have some shortcomings, but we all do. And through God, anything is possible. And have a blessed day.